I've been running in these woods for as long as I can remember, but this might make me change my mind. The story began at around 6.30 p.m. I had finished eating and decided to go on a run, as usual. I always used the same path across the street, run for about a kilometer, and pass the gate that goes into the woods. Something important to note is that the trail I use into the forest is separated about halfway through. One path is paved and the other isn't. I usually go into the unpaved path first and then turn into the paved one after about three kilometers. Nothing ever really goes wrong. I meet some rare people walking their dogs, but other than that, I'm pretty alone. At least, I thought I was. I had been running for a while now when I heard a notification coming from my phone. An airdrop notification. Since I didn't want to make it look like I was worried, I kept running for a couple minutes and then stopped to change the music. I opened the airdrop dreadfully. Who the hell was sending me stuff? I was pretty sure I was alone. I clicked on the drop and my heart sunk. It was a Snapchat picture of me running with the caption, You look good. I didn't turn around. Instead, I kept running like nothing happened until I reached a certain point. You see, the forest is surrounded by a fence to stop children from coming in unsupervised, and I didn't like that rule when I was little, so my friend and I cut a hole in it. When I was aligned with that hole, I quickly turned and buried myself into the forest, aiming for my escape. I could hear ruffling behind me, and I still didn't turn back. When I finally reached the hole, I jumped through it and absolutely booked it to the fire station that was a couple streets down. The last thing I could hear when leaving the forest was an angry huff and metal meeting metal. I still don't know who it was or what they wanted from me, but I never ran in that forest, ever, again. When I was 18, I lived in a detached garage apartment that had a second apartment upstairs. My apartment was an efficiency and only had walls without doors to separate the rooms. The second floor was being renovated and no one rented it. At night, I would hear footsteps and it sounded like it came from upstairs. I could hear someone going up and down the stairs outside at night. One time, I had put my St. Bernard out on a tie to potty and I went outside when I heard scratching on the steps to find her wrapped around the stairs in a way that she couldn't have done by herself. I started having friends stay over because I thought I was imagining things since it was my first time living alone. One night, I was laying in bed and I heard a noise that woke me up. I looked up half awake and saw a shadowy figure at the foot of my bed. I could see the outline of what looked like a thin man or woman with shaggy hair and a top hat. I told myself I was just being paranoid and imagining things. I grabbed a hold of my dog and covered us up with a blanket, telling myself it wasn't real. A few weeks later, my car had a baseball thrown through the window. I was out taping my window, and my neighbor came out to talk to me. A young couple rented the house on the same lot. I asked her if she knew if the landlord had either been working on the upstairs unit or maybe rented it out, because I kept hearing noises. She told me no and offered to have her husband go take a look upstairs in the unit. While he was inspecting, she started telling me to be aware of a homeless man who was seen in the alley behind us. I asked her to describe him, 
and she tells me he's tall, thin, dirty long hair, and always wearing a funny hat like the Mad Hatter. Her husband comes back and tells me that the door was unlocked, that the floor isn't done in the apartment upstairs, and there's no possible way someone could be up there because there was no place to step. I called my mom and she helped me move. While I was loading the U-Haul, I found three house keys in random places in my yard. All of them went to my door. I'm pretty sure this dude was just living with me, and I had no idea. I'm 17 years old and from Canada, where I live is quite isolated. Not isolated to the point where I'm in the middle of nowhere, but there isn't many people in my town. A few months ago, a really old couple who had been our neighbors since I was born were moved into a caring home, and the house was put up for sale. My dad had a friend at the house selling firm, so he knew when it got sold and it got sold about one month after they moved out. My mom and dad were working, but I was at home, since the whole COVID thing made us get homeschooled. Someone knocked at my door. I'm not really a fan of social interactions, especially when home alone, because believe me, I've watched enough scary shit to know. After about four knocks, I knew they wouldn't stop so I went downstairs and opened the door, but I made sure that I was still on the phone call to my friend, and I made it clear that I was talking to someone, as when I answered I said, give me a second hunter, just as a precaution. I answered the door to an older guy. He looked rough, but a type of rough that was well-groomed, if that made sense. I said what's up, and he explained he's the new neighbor, I didn't know what to say, so I was just like, Hey, what's up? He asked if he could come in because it was snowing pretty bad outside, and he just came to inspect his property. Knowing my mom would shout at me if I got off on the wrong foot with the new neighbor, I let him in. He just sat on the sofa whilst we talked, and he asked questions about the neighborhood. After about ten minutes, he asked if he could use the bathroom, and then he would be on his way. I said sure, it's upstairs on the left. He went up, and I was talking to my friend still. He was up there for about five minutes, so I shouted up, Hey, are you okay? Not that I was concerned, I just wanted this guy gone. He replied, Yeah, it's all smooth sailing up here, or something like that. When he came down, he wasn't wearing his jacket anymore. Instead, he had it rolled in a ball in his hands. At the time, I didn't take note, but the more I think about it, the more sense it makes. I see him out and say bye and stuff, and that's that. I talk to my friend on FaceTime and then go upstairs to my room. Now, I have OCD so I know I'd never leave my door just a bit open. I think to myself, what has this dude done as I look around? The only thing I noticed that was out of place was my drawer. The middle one was just a bit open. I check it, and all of my underwear is gone. I'm like, what the hell? I check my dirty laundry basket behind my door and all of my dirty underwear are gone from that, too. I call my mom and ask her about the underwear and if she's done any laundry. She says no, and I freak out and call my dad and ask him about the neighbors. He says, Oh yeah, I've spoken to the dad. British guy. Lovely fella. My heart sunk as I realized I let a random guy into my house and God knows why he wanted my underwear. I'm 
I'm a student in a South American country. I speak English and French, so I tutor people in my free time to make some money to buy textbooks and medicines. Because of the pandemic, many of my students could not pay anymore, so I was left with no one. Until this guy showed up. He's like 50, loud and weird. He has a daughter my age, I'm 19 and a wife, and yet every time he talks about them, he's either trash-talking his wife or saying stuff about his daughter, like, she's really sexy, and talking about her boyfriends, really scary. I've been tempted to stop teaching him, but until I find other students, I can't. The thing is, we live in the same city, and we have not yet met, yet. He's obsessed with finding out my address. He says stuff like, I'm beautiful, or it's so strange that I don't have a boyfriend. He draws, but he doesn't draw suns and flowers. He only draws naked women, and he draws them while looking at me during our classes. Luckily, these are online classes, but I swear every time I have to teach him, five times a week. I want to die. He always talks about how hot he was when he was young, about how many women he used to sleep with. He says the most sexist things. He has another daughter who is nine years old, fucking nine years old, and he always says that he is worried about her turning out gay because he can deal with a whore daughter, but not a lesbian. It's just non-stop inappropriate comments about women, about me, about my sexual life. He knows I'm struggling with money, and he always takes advantage of that. He always asks me for my address. I laugh and play dumb, change topics, but he insists. He says things like, I want to know where you live so we can hang out. He's so awful. But last week... It got really scary. He said he had another student for me. I said, great. Next morning, I woke up to five messages of him asking me personal info for this new student. And of course, asking for my address. The thing is, he found a fucking address. My last address. I moved some months ago, and the address he found and showed me was my last address. I'm not stupid. I have never put my personal info online. The guy is a programmer. He works with computers and he's really good at it. And I am scared because the only place he could have found that address is a government website as it is listed as my current address. I have not changed it. He also found my full name, but I only gave him my first. I always use VPNs. I have a full system protecting my phone and laptop that my cousin installed, and I have been trying to search my address online, and it just doesn't show up. I'm freaked out. Every time I go out, I'm afraid I will encounter him on the street. Let's just hope we will never meet. So, I've been living alone in a foreign country for a year already. The last months I've been taking a ferry to move, because the metro is usually crowded, stressful, and in COVID times, a big no for me. So, the ferry is always the best option, at least. This was my thought until this week. On Monday, a random guy probably 30 to 35, sat next to me on the ferry and tried to talk. I'm not good with the language yet, so I let him understand that I didn't know what he was saying. He kept talking and showed me his phone. He had just taken a picture of me. I asked him to delete it, but he didn't understand, 
so I just ignored him to make him stop. It was irrelevant at the moment. On Tuesday, I noticed the guy from the ferry again, but this time, he greeted me and called me by my name, which of course surprised me, since I don't know him. He sat next to me and kept talking non-stop. But this time, he went over familiar and tried to hug me. For my luck, a woman noticed it and sat between him and me, pretending to be my friend. On Wednesday, I used the metro instead of the ferry, so it was normal. On Thursday, I took the ferry, and this guy was there again. This time, he sat far away. When the ferry reached the other side, I noticed the guy was following me, so I changed route and went to a bus stop, which is just next to the ferry port. As it was late night, there weren't many people around. I was scared, so I sat in the bus stop, and there was a couple waiting, so I felt safe. But the stalker came and sat next to me, and suddenly held my arm while saying, Come, come, come and trying to take me with him. At this moment, I just held his arm tight and asked for help. The couple next to me called the police and I did the report. I mentioned that on Monday he was taking pictures of me and that he might be doing the same with other girls. Police asked for his phone and to my surprise, he handed it over to them with no problems like he was sure that nothing was going to happen. When police checked his phone, they found pictures of me, but not just from Monday. This guy has been taking pictures of me for months, months. Not just in the ferry, but also in the parking site and even outside my home. Besides my pictures, they found pictures of different girls which I believe he has been following for months as well. The worst thing about this whole situation is that when I filed the report to the police, they couldn't do anything about it because this guy hasn't hurt me. So, right now, I'm looking for a new place to move. I asked my cousin if she'd ever had any bizarre or interesting stories working as a surgical assistant. Not only had I not expected to hear anything interesting enough to post here, but in truth, I never imagined I'd hear anything as horrendous as this. I actually started to get ill typing this up. Brace yourselves. I'm a surgical technician who works in the intensive care unit. We got a patient in 2010 who was a level one on the emergency severity index. Level ones are people in need of immediate life-saving care. In short, they're the most important patients in the hospital, though to admit that goes against our code of ethics. We had a man wheeled in on a ventilator and his skin was jaundice yellow with odd patches of blue. Not only that, but he was projectile vomiting blood. It truly looked like something out of a zombie film. He was covered in dirt with a long white beard, thin as a bone, ribs visible as a skeleton and sunburned all over. He was screaming that his stomach was going to burst while intermittently crying out for his mother whom he said he could see in the room. Not only did he have something life-threatening occurring, but he was also hallucinating. The man stunk like nothing I'd ever smelled. We all used smelling salts as if he were already a rotting corpse. We asked him what he had eaten, and in between unintelligible mutterings, he said that he eats dirt. It's all I can eat, I'm homeless. We immediately gave him an abdominal x-ray 
and what should have been normal and dark came up as white inside his lungs as well. We immediately put him under and started performing a partial gastrectomy after a scope which indicated compaction of undigested earth. A bronchoscopy was done to see how much buildup was in his lungs, but by this time they'd filled up with blood. He died on the surgical table. Unfortunately, dirt goes in like dust, some going into his lungs and the rest into his intestines. Though we can't perform an autopsy in the ER, we did a full abdominal and intestinal scope. His guts from the abdominal cavity to the jejunum, top of the small intestine connecting to the esophagus, was not only filled with rotting, undigested earth, but foraging through it were literal earthworms, maybe a hundred or more. The guy was a six foot deep corpse even when he was alive. They'd made a home inside this guy's entire insides, and his lungs, well, the fact that he lived so long and was able to breathe was some sort of divine coincidence. The coroner said that his insides were a worm farm, and days after the man named Abner had died, they were still alive and cohabitating. He even said they'd been breeding and had birthed babies, like some sort of death stew. He'd also formed an army of tapeworms intermingling in with the other worms, eating each other. The tapeworms were actually attacking the earthworms, and riddled all through him were chunks of worm guts. It was a fucking feeding frenzy. No wonder he felt like he was going to burst. His stomach had stretched to twice its normal size. Had he lived, three quarters of his stomach would have needed to be removed and anything more than a few green beans could have torn the tiny ball his stomach now was in half. Never in my life had I been witness to something so gut-wrenching and macabre. So please, everyone, if you're truly starving, find a food kitchen or shelter. Do not chow down on parasite-infested earth for, well, however long. I live in a small, small town. You blink and you miss it. The best we can boast about is a single stop sign and a gas station, which we only have because of a nearby highway. Any actual semblance of a town is 25 minutes away. So, when things get scary out here, it's amplified. The occasional homeless person is no big deal. They're often drifting through. Drug addicts run rampant and will steal everything they can from your house, but it's the normal out here. However, what happened a few years ago certainly wasn't normal. Originally, I was dead asleep in my bed. I only woke up because it was burning hot in my room, but it was summertime and not much I could do. I just remember tossing and turning until I got a creepy feeling that fell into the pit of my stomach. I glanced over to the bathroom door that was open with the light on. Everything was normal. I left the light on so I wouldn't trip and die if I had to pee in the middle of the night. Next, I glanced at the window directly across from my bed. I had no curtains, but I did have a shitty set of blinds. Part of the blinds are broken from wear and tear, and the crappy AC output beneath it would make them move back and forth so you'd get a glimpse outside every so often. The yard light was still going, but what made me stop was the outline at my window. The figure of someone was directly at my window, almost like it was waiting for the blinds to move 
to watch me. I didn't have an imagination as a child. That had been trained out of me. But the sight was enough to pour every horror film into my head at that moment. I squeezed my eyes shut and pulled the blankets over my head and slept in a cloth oven that night. By morning time, the figure was gone. I remember running to my mom's room on the verge of tears in the morning, telling her what had happened. She laughed at me like I was an idiot and told me it was probably just a stray cat that had climbed up for one odd reason or another. I almost believed her since my window was pretty high off the ground, but something didn't sit right. Later that day, when we were doing yard work, I glanced over at my window and saw one of our metal patio chairs had been pushed up to it. I pointed it out to my mom, who proceeded to chew me out. That's how the cat probably got up there, moron. Stop leaving furniture everywhere. But I hadn't moved it. It was heavy enough that I had struggled with it. So, we moved it back, and so began a pattern. At night, I'd see the figure, complain to my mom, and we'd find a chair moved back every single morning. This went on for weeks. My mother stopped caring about my concerns, until one morning, we saw where the outside screen of my window had been sliced open. I still remember her shaking her head and complaining about those damn stray cats that we had still yet to see. I could tell she was unnerved by that development. I couldn't handle it anymore, and I opted to sleep in our living room that night. The only problem was, our kitchen and our living room connected, which meant there was always several windows. The first night of my move went well, despite my back hurting from the couch. I avoided my room like the plague. It wasn't until about four days later that I ran into an issue. I woke up and glanced at the clock above the fireplace. It read a little past 3 a.m. I couldn't realize why I'd woken up until it happened again. There was a beam of light shining in from the kitchen window, almost like someone was shining a flashlight in. I saw it trace along the walls and land on the love seat across from the couch I was on. I was mortified. When I told my mom, she continued to laugh at me. I gave in and decided I would sleep in my dad's room, even though it had a gigantic window. He slept in the recliner with a huge TV, so I felt more safe having someone around. The yard light was directly outside my window anyways. It seemed foolproof. That was, until I woke up out of habitual fear and watched through the window across from the bed. Everything seemed normal as time drug on, and I felt like a moron. Maybe my mom was right. That was until I saw a lone figure come out of the woods by the backyard shed, walk directly under the light, and head to the patio furniture like he'd been here plenty of times before. I still remember the large build the man had, and the confidence like he was the one who lived here and wasn't creeping around my yard in the dead of night. I just remember listening to the TV until I fell asleep again, hoping to get another glimpse. My dad would have been pissed if I had woken him up. He was grumpy on a good day, and terrifying on a bad day. I didn't feel like risking it, unless I had solid proof, because I was scared. The next morning, my mom chewed me out again for the patio furniture, which was routine almost a month later. But this time, something new happened. She demanded I stop playing in the toolboxes of the garage. A bunch of tools had been taken out and left on our doorstep. Screwdrivers, a large hammer, flashlights, etc. It wasn't me. I begged with my mom and pleaded with her. Just stay up with me one night. We couldn't close our garage because it was an open carport and I wasn't going to get my ass beat for touching tools because of someone else. It was driving me mad. Finally, she agreed. That night, we would stay awake in the living room. 
I finally fell asleep before my mom did, but I remember her waking me up in a panic. She pointed to the window that overlooked into our garage. We could see the top of someone's head as they walked back and forth. There was a sound of someone placing metal tools down on the brick steps, as if they were trying to be quiet but couldn't fully muffle it. She whispered for me to go wake my dad. My dad was angry, having been woken up in the middle of the night by his frantic daughter. He grabbed his pistol and headed out from the back door, towards the front of the house where the garage was located. We heard my dad screaming and someone dropping tools, then the shot of a gun, twice. The frantic footsteps pounding out of the garage felt like they were coming from my chest. My mom peeked out of the window and then opened the door, and my dad stumbled in. He had missed both shots because of his unstable aim, but told us that there was a man crouching at our front door, looking at our door handle. None of us slept that night, and in the morning the law from the closest town arrived. They didn't do much besides ask if anything had been stolen for a description of the man, and then they told us to install cameras. That was it. They said the guy was probably just looking for something easy to steal for quick money. If that had been the case, why hadn't he stolen the tools, the generator, the welder, or broken into any vehicles just sitting in the garage? We finally set up hunting trail cameras around the house, but nothing has happened since. Coming home from college for holidays, I still have nightmares about the incident years later when I sleep in my own bed. I don't know what he was looking for or why he did the things he did. Whatever the case may be, man at the window, let's not meet. A little backstory. So, I was a security guard for this local company in my area. I was assigned to a water park with another guard who was a regular there, keeping watch. He was to train me and show me around and tell me what codes opened what doors. I first noticed how quick he was to enter and leave the property. He never wanted to spend more than 10 minutes inside the property before he was eager to leave. Our first night was simple. There was nothing exciting or interesting going on, so our night dragged. After a few hours, I asked him if he'd experienced anything unusual while working there. He told me he's had some problems with people trying to enter the property without permission, but that's about it. He also told me he hated working there because of his encounters with these people. He said they creeped him out because of how sneaky they were. He didn't really want to tell me much because he was afraid that I would leave the post. That should have been a red flag for me, but I was too excited to let anything like that scare me. A few more hours later and our shift is over, so we clock out and go home for the day. The next night, my boss calls me to explain that the security guard, my partner, has resigned. I was a little upset because now I was to work a two-man post all day by myself with barely any knowledge on the place. Fast forward a few weeks. I started to get the hang of the place and created my own routine with no issues at all. No break-ins, no vandalism, nothing. It's now 2 a.m. and I was outside at the front of the property completing my rounds when I heard a door slam from inside. I jumped because of how loud it was. As I started to walk back into the property, I continued to hear doors opening and closing. I could feel myself getting nervous because it was my first situation I've ever had at this place. As I walk inside and start checking the doors and complete around to make sure that there was no one in the property, I get to this corridor where there was a set of stairs that lead down to a door that was wide open. I walked down the stairs to close and lock the door because I was too scared to take a look inside. As I turned around to head back up the stairs, 
I noticed a man dressed in all black standing at the top of the stairs. I take a step back and realize I'm cornered. If he was to try anything, I would have nowhere to run or hide. So I politely ask him if he needed any help. He didn't reply. I then asked him how he got into the property. He still didn't reply. He slowly turned his head and snapped his fingers. Then, from the left side of the staircase, another man slowly crawled to his side like a dog on all fours. I then turned around and kicked the door open and ran inside and locked myself in a bathroom as I called my boss and told them what I had witnessed. They sent an armed security guard to my position to complete a walkthrough and make sure I was safe. As I got the call that the area was clear, I came out and told them everything from start to finish. I realized that they didn't believe me, so I clocked out and went home for the night. The next morning, I received a call from my boss explaining that they checked the security footage from the night before, and what they told me horrified me. Every hour when I would complete my rounds inside the property, those same two men would follow me through the facility as if they were stalking me, like as if it was a game to them. After that, I asked for a new position because I was too horrified to work at the water park. I now know why my trainer didn't want to work there anymore. I've been working for an independent hotel for just over four years now. We're the number one rated hotel in our city, and proud of it. I mostly work in housekeeping, but have done some time at the front desk as well. I love my job, and have always said that my bosses are great. Now, being a housekeeper, I've seen some things. I've seen a room where someone snuck in their dog, kitten, and chicken. We don't allow pets. I once had a room that I was cleaning as a stayover that had tripods set up all around the bed, professional camera equipment cases, an adult-sized pacifier, on-site, and extra-large-sized children's diapers. The two people that were in the room were in their early 20s. I even had a room once that we had to call the cops on for a raid because we found meth. They found a lot of drugs and guns in that room. But today, today is the first time I've actually felt scared to be in a guest's room. As I'm working on a room that has already been vacated, a man in the next room over catches me at my supply cart. He's said to be staying for several days and tells me, you can go ahead and clean my room now. I'm going down for breakfast. Excellent. I love getting my stayovers done early on. It makes things easier for the people working laundry the sooner we get the dirty laundry down to them. So, I pop on over to his room, opening it up and propping the door open with a stopper like we always do. The first thing I notice is that he has around 20 prescription bottles lined up on one of the two beds, along with insulin and needles. I'm nosy, I'll admit it, and I wanted to see what he was on. Oddly, it was only two different types of medication for all 20 bottles. About two-thirds were a diabetes medication, and the rest were a cholesterol medication. That's a little weird that he has so many bottles of the same meds, but whatever. I go to make the bed and see that some of the bedding has been stained and sigh. Knowing now I'll have to change all of the bedding now instead of just being able to turn down the sheets and blanket. So, I leave the room, closing it behind me, and go to get the linens I need, and then head right back to the room. I prop the door open again, and head to set the clean linens on the desk chair, when I see out of the corner of my eye, two notes sitting on the TV armoire. It wouldn't mean anything except I caught the word kill scrawled on it. I dropped the linens and took a closer look. What I read on the first note 
made my blood run cold. You don't have to forgive her. You just can't kill her. You are here to take money and alcohol away from you. Get over having to kill her, and you can safely leave. My heart was pounding. My eyes went to the second note, which had just looked like a to-do list at first glance, but in the end made my stomach churn. Spray in wash. Apply for Medicare. Insubordination. The soul is healed by being with children. Bank card follow-up. Inheritance. Savings. Kauai Pa. 10,500. Map Montana. There will be a day of reckoning. Did you tell mom what I said? How did Bev get my address? It was too much. I quickly snapped pictures of them on my phone so I could show my boss why I would not clean his room. I left the room quickly, closing it up behind me. As the door closes, I turn and see the man just ten feet away from me, coming back to his room. My heart is in my throat, but I manage a smile and tell him, I, I need more supplies. I'll be back in your room in a bit. I take off straight for the elevator, having noticed our maintenance man was waiting for the slow transport. In a hushed tone, I tell him what I found, and he sees I'm shaken. Not a normal state for me. He rides down with me, and I go straight to my boss to tell her that for the first time in all of these years, I am not comfortable being in a guest's room. I show her the pictures, and her face is still and pale. She goes to the front desk and asks our general manager for a minute of her time and brings her into the office to show her. She agreed this was not a safe situation and took our maintenance man with her to go inform the man that he had one hour to get his belongings and leave the hotel and he was not welcome back. I spent a few minutes in the laundry room trying to calm down then my boss went back up with me to the floor until the man was officially out of the hotel. I don't know who Bev is. I don't know who the woman is that he didn't feel he needed to forgive. But man in room 422, let's never meet again. This happened in 2008, when I was nine years old. I lived in a townhome community, where each road had two sides of homes. In between the backs of the houses, there was a back road with alleyways that went in between each building section. I lived on the edge of one of these, and my townhome was on one of the alleyways. I lived on one street, and across the back road on the opposite side, lived an elderly woman whose name I don't even remember. I'm not sure what her situation was, but for whatever reason, she never liked me specifically. She was creepy and spray painted all of her windows so that no one could see into her house. However, that never stopped her from sometimes staring out of her bedroom window directly at mine and keeping it open at night to shine a red strobe light into my room across the way. She used to yell how she hated us. I was in the fourth grade, and on a particular January morning, I had unfortunately missed the bus. My dad sent me outside to get in the car so he could drive me, and he said he'd follow me out soon after. As I was walking to my dad's car, she came out of the alleyway next to my house, slowly, with a gigantic kitchen knife behind her back. She raised it and started running after me. I was faster than her, so I was able to avoid her and was able to get into the house. She walked and stood on the neighbor's porch across the way and stared at my house. I was terrified. My dad ran out and yelled at her, and she said she wanted to get rid of us stupid kids. My parents called the police, but the police sent her home and had an ambulance pick her up later. My parents went to some kind of court meeting about it, but I don't really know the details. 
I didn't see her again after that, until one year later. I don't remember the day, but it had snowed that morning, so I was going to run out of the front door and play in the snow. I opened the door to see her standing on the porch, but looking out towards the road. I panicked, closed the door, and locked it. I ran up to my parents' room and told them what had happened, and we saw her walk off the porch and up the street. I never saw her again after that. My family has since moved far away from there, but people I know say she still lives there, and her windows are still the same spray-painted windows. Though it doesn't affect me as much as it used to, I still don't like being around knives. This happened when I was in high school, long ago. My mom just recently found the paperwork about it when she cleaned out her office upon retiring from the police department. I remember being upset and scared when it happened, but reading the details as an adult, it sounded even worse than I remembered. I was a 17-year-old female working at a flower and gift shop. It's nighttime. A man comes in, short, overweight, balding, forties, and creepy. He tells me about how he needs an apology gift for his girlfriend, so I offer a bouquet. Obviously, it's a flower shop. He says she doesn't like flowers because they die. This was the first weird thing, as he came into a flower shop. Then, he goes into detail about how he hit her and asks me if I think he was right to do so. This was long ago, so I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of, not if you want her to continue being your girlfriend. He then tells me what a great job I'm doing, and asks me when I get off work. I dodge answering, and he leaves. Nothing for six months. Then, right before Valentine's Day, he walks in the door one minute before close. It was dark, and from the outside, it looked like I was working alone, as my co-worker, about 40-year-old female, was in the bathroom. Instinctively, it felt like a predator had just entered the room. You know when something isn't right, and everything felt not right. I then notice he has a tarnished revolver tucked into the front of his windbreaker, which is halfway unzipped. It was obvious he wanted it seen. I quickly scribbled a note to my coworker that said, he has a gun, and handed it to her when she came out of the bathroom. She calmly walked to the phone and looked at me, wordlessly asking if she should call the cops. I shook my head no, as I felt it would escalate the situation. God forbid he heard the police coming and took us hostage or something. I was just going to try and act as calm and normal as I could and hopefully not tip the situation into something more dangerous. He spends 15 minutes wandering around what was a fairly small shop. In retrospect, he was probably waiting to see if my coworker would leave as it was now well past closing. Finally, he places an order for a pickup on Valentine's Day, which gives me his name and his info for the police report I'm sure as hell about to file. He buys a card and pulls out a wad of $100 bills, which he slowly thumbs through, as though looking for the right one to which to pay for his $40 order. I ask him if he wants a bag, as it wouldn't be very inconspicuous if he just showed up at home with the Valentine's Day card. He replies, No, I don't feel like being inconspicuous tonight, which seemed like an obvious reference to the gun hanging out of his coat. He leaves, we quickly lock the door and watch him sit in his truck outside. We were not about to exit the shop until he was gone. Finally, he pulls out of his parking spot 
and moves to another spot further away and continues to just sit there. I don't know how long we waited, but he finally left. I called my mom, crying. She called the police, who came to the shop the next day to take a report. I told my best friend at the time what happened, and she told her mother. Her mother happened to work with the man and informed security at her job. She said he was very weird, creepy, and liked to talk about weapons a lot. Security at his job. It's a large company with government contracts and things having to deal with tech and security. Pulled him into the office and questioned him about it. He claimed it was a glove in his pocket, not a revolver. The police were pissed that his company made contact with him about it before they did, and he successfully dodged the cops' multiple calls and visits to his apartment. My mom, much to my teen fury at the time, made me quit my job, which was devastating as I loved it there. In retrospect, totally the right call. Dude came in on Valentine's Day, picked up his order. I never saw him again. This happened a few months ago to my friends and I. We are university students in Cape Town, South Africa. So, when we aren't trying to just get through the semester, we like to let our habits get the better of us and go out for drinks. On this night, we had just finished what felt like an extra long day at university and decided to head to a bar about five minutes from campus for some much needed stress relief. The evening was going well, although a bit slow. It was enjoyable with everyone having a drink and getting a bit restless. So, me being one of the more outgoing ones in the group, I suggested we head to the pool bar not far from where we were. Everyone agrees and we get our stuff and go. We all jump in my car and we get to the bar, but being a Thursday night, parking was scarce. I finally managed to find a spot about a block away from the bar, but in a secluded side of the street. I should also mention that this bar is in one of the sketchier parts of town, but is normally quite safe due to the amount of nightlife associated with being so close to a university. We walked to the bar and no one really felt uneasy, nor did anything happen to make us feel that way, which was quite surprising. After a few hours of some pool and just relaxing, we decided it was time to grab dinner before the restaurants close, as being in South Africa means that most restaurants, even fast food, close really early at around 7 or 8 p.m. to comply with the curfew. We decided to stop at the pizza place below the bar to grab some food before we all decided what the plan for the end of the night was. Because our group was so large and the pizza place being so small, we decided to have those getting food go inside while the others who didn't just wait outside in the street. This was an easy decision as the pizza place had a massive open window with a built-on counter so we could still all talk to each other. This is where things started to get a little weird. While we were waiting for our friends inside the pizza place to come out, this massive white van pulls up past us and stops. The driver wasn't an intimidating looking dude. He was skinny, looked to be about average height with a shoulder long blonde hair. A pretty standard looking dude for the kind of area we were in. He calls me and asks if I think his van could fit in a parking spot just behind him. For perspective, this parking spot could probably fit like a small hatchback, maybe. This dude is driving a full long size panel van. This makes me kind of uneasy as I thought that as a driver, you should know where your car can and cannot definitely fit and this was one of them. I explained to him that I didn't think it was even worth attempting. He responds telling me that he has faith in his ability 
and I should come stand behind the van and direct him. This gave me major red flags, and after a few back and forths, he just pulls the emergency brake up and sits and stares at my friends and I for what felt like an eternity. He then thanked us and drove off. This sparks my friends to come outside from the pizza place as they just saw what happened and were very confused. We are all kind of weirded out but think nothing of it and everyone eats their pizza as we try to decide what the plan is for the last hour or two we have before curfew. Most of us decide that this is where the night is gonna end and we're all kind of weirded out by the guy in the van. A few others decide that they were going to just stay and Uber home a little later in the evening. With our group number cut down to four, we decided to walk back to the car and just head home. When we left the pizza place, a homeless person calls us and was insisting that we had nothing to worry about with the guy in the van, which didn't help with anyone's nerves. We then decided to head back to the car but as soon as we turn the corner to approach the side of the street where the car was parked, we see Van Man again, this time not quite so happy as he seemed in his encounter earlier. I made a cheeky comment about him finally finding a parking spot he could fit in while we were walking past each other, and he just stared at my friends and I, not breaking eye contact even when we passed him. I turned around to see if he was still looking. He was, but as we turned the corner of the side of the street with the car, I saw it and my heart sank. The van, horribly parked half on and half off the sidewalk, back door slightly open. Upon seeing this, I turn around and see Van Man is now walking towards us, but he said something that confused me at first but immediately made sense after. He said, Hey, please just watch my car, which confused me. But when he said that, four men sat up from leaning on the wall next to it and began following us. My friends and I were slightly ahead of them, so we were trying to discuss the game plan because it was obvious if we did nothing, something horrible was going to happen. My friends start walking faster, and I remain at the same speed, frantically searching my pocket for my car keys, all the while shouting at my friends to wait up and asking what the rush was, all in hopes the guys behind us, who were gaining on us, were oblivious to us knowing they had sinister intentions. As soon as the car came into view, we booked it, jumped in, and drove away but we were only seconds away from not being that lucky. After locking the car doors, I saw the men surrounding the car. I managed to get us out, and looking back in the mirror, I saw a fifth man by the van at the bottom of the street. I still have no idea what their intentions were that night, if it was to rob us, or just beat us up, or worse. I don't really like to think about how lucky we were that night. I ask that when you're out, no matter how innocent an interaction with someone can seem, always pay attention to the little things. So, to the man in the van my friends and I saw that night, can we please not meet again? I apologize in advance since I'm not a good writer, but I'll do my best to share my experience. To better paint the picture, here is a description of myself at the time of this incident, three years ago. Five foot five, 26 year old woman, medium length bleach blonde hair, curvy, 175 pounds, wearing black high-waisted tights and a pink crop top. Three years ago, I was walking home late at night from my friend's house. 
It was dark, and at the time, I lived in a rough part of a large city. I've had many sketchy situations that I've gotten myself out of, so I guess I felt sort of invincible, like nothing truly scary could happen to me. When I walk alone, I always stay very alert and aware of my surroundings, for my own safety, just in case. About halfway home, and roughly ten minutes to my apartment, I notice a van start tailing me. I was used to this since, in my city, it's very common for young women in a rough area to get propositioned for sex. It's embarrassing how desensitized to this I was. I did my usual and crossed the road so that I would be walking beside the traffic, heading in the other direction. I wasn't scared, just annoyed. The van then turned down a side street then back onto the road I was on, and pulled up to me. At this point, I still wasn't scared. Again, this has happened so many times that it never mattered if I was wearing something that showed more skin, or if I was wearing a winter coat zipped from just below my chin, all the way down to my ankles. That area is notorious for that type of activity. I decided to be firm and I told the person sternly, I'm not interested. I noticed there were two men in the van. They looked almost identical, as they may have been twins or brothers. Both men had a very, very dark complexion, dark eyes, and dark, short hair. The van didn't move. I was super annoyed and crossed the road again to get away. At this point, I figured this would be enough for them to stop following me. They didn't. They kept circling back every time I crossed the road. I've never had to put that much effort into getting a horny pervert to leave me alone. So this is when I started feeling unsafe. They zipped by me at the speed traffic was flowing in, and I yelled for them to F off. I thought it finally worked. It had been three minutes, and I hadn't seen the van, so I thought I was in the clear. Just in case, I pulled my phone out and was getting ready to call my sister that I lived with. Just then, the van pulled up to me very quickly, and before I could even blink, one of the men jumped out of the van, opened the back door, and approached me quickly in an aggressive manner, as if he were about to scoop me up and throw me into the vehicle. The traffic in that area is very inconsistent. It was dead, and I imagine that is what they were waiting for. Just as the man was about to place his hands on me, I tilted my phone and said, You are being filmed in my live video chat. I gave my friends your license plate number, and the police have been notified. I was so scared, but I didn't let that show. I stayed as calm as I could. The man paused like he was considering if I was bluffing or telling the truth, so I tilted the phone more as to give the fake audience a better look at him. He then jumped into the van and they sped off. I have never been the same since that night. I'm afraid of walking alone now, even in the daytime. Stay safe out there. Two creeps in the van. Let's not ever meet. I hope karma finds you both soon.